chapter 1, verse 3, the book of Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I don't think that we can preach on faith too much. The word contending means to really press in. For the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I love to get around the older generation, older than me, and hear them talk about the mighty works of God. These older saints, there's a song that said, I was there when it happened, and I guess I ought to know. It's refreshing to hear people still talking about what God, not only God used to do, but what he is still doing. I'm glad God is still doing some stuff that's not all still in the past. I'm glad that Moses, it didn't stop with Moses or Elijah, but it's still going on. But everything comes by faith. And here the writer said, I want to impress you or encourage you to earnestly, that means with all of our heart, contend, that means do a warfare, for the kind of faith that moves mountains, that heals the sick, that delivers. Hebrews chapter 11. I've talked on faith several days this, days this week on radio. And I believe Brother Dean quoted this scripture earlier from Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, the Lord gave me a thought on Hebrews chapter 11 about the people that were contending for faith. No two people fight the same warfare of faith. Each one here today, your struggle is different than the one sitting by you, in front of you, or behind you. And really, I had never picked up on that until this week. And we believe and we know that we're in the end time. We're in the end time. And I've seen things on TV this week on the news that if, no, if nothing else convinced you that we're in the end time, it did. The material they are teaching our little children with in primary, we used to call it primary, kindergarten. I mean little bitty things, little bitty babies training their little minds to be perverted is the bottom line. And it showed the, the little booklets, the books that they're using to get a hold of this end time generation. The little ones. And it, it was an abomination uh, to the human race as to what they're doing. So I thank God for the politicians that's running for office to try to to get a hold on this thing and put a, a stop to it. Listen, I pray that if they're running against this mess, that they will win. Amen. But even if they do, it's going to take the church. Right. Actually, it's the church world that the Lord is dependent on. He's not dependent on the politicians. He's dependent upon the church. Amen. Contending for that kind of faith that gets a hold of God, then God gets a hold of the heart of people. But here... There's two generations to me that kind of go hand in hand. That's in verse 5 and also verse 7. It said, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Now, I believe that we are in the generation of Enoch. Why do I say that? Because he contended, he contended for the translation power. We call it 
the, the res, not just the resurrection power, but we, we call it, listen, the, the rapture anointing. How many today, you, you want to go in the rapture? Enoch is a type of the generation that believed to go through a walk with God, consecrated with God, called the rapture generation. Now, to do this, I, I believe there's going to be a rapture of the church. I believe there's going to be a change. And I believe that that change will, little by little by little, manifest itself in the church. I believe the closer we come to the actual point of the rapture, the more you're going to see people kind of turn loose of things. You see, we can't keep holding on to things and yet turn loose of things at the same time. So right now, our, our problem is we want to hold on to things on planet Earth. But the sooner, the closer the rapture comes, the more we're going to get to the place where we're going to turn loose everything. And by the time that thing happens, it's going to be uh, even so, Lord, come right now. But Enoch had a walk with God that pleased God. And that walk was that he should not see death. That death would have no hold on him. And that he would experience the translation power of the living God. Well, now, Enoch had to walk by faith to do that. And I thought of Jude where it says, Contending for the faith that was delivered the saints. Well, the faith that got Enoch translated that he should not see death was a faith that caused him to walk with God. Not just to talk about God, but to walk with God. I mean, you, you talk about a walk, a, a talk, a consecrated walk, to walk with God so close. Well, now this is one of the, the, the saints that Enoch was talking about when he said you've got to contend for that faith if you want to be in the rapture, in the rapture, in the rapture, the catching away. And I'm hearing more and more and more and more people talk about the time of the rapture. That means that whatever sometimes we've almost sold your soul for, to go in the rapture, you're going to have to leave some stuff here. It's not going to be raptured with you. Sister Marie Jackson loved her jewelry and her beautiful clothes. She loved it. I mean, her son made sure that her toenails looked perfect. Her fingernails looked perfect. Everything looked perfect. And she was a walking model of modesty. But when she left here, none of her beautiful clothes went with her. Nothing she had went with her. So at some point, we've got to learn to turn loose of everything and say, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. My concentration is going to be with you because, Lord, I believe that this thing called the rapture is coming soon. I believe it's now at hand, but somehow the church world cannot get a grip with it enough to press in for the kind of faith. It's going to take faith. It is going to take some kind of faith to have this walk that Enoch walked, the end time walk with God, that caused God to have such a connection to Enoch. The name Enoch, I looked it up, and I forgot really what it means, but it had a good meaning. But the generation that has a walk with God, do you know of specific people in your life that has got such a connection with God. All they talk about is the things of God. All they want is the things of God. All they're hungry for is another move of God. All they're willing to pay the price for is another move of God. The glory of God to hit the pulpit one more time. The power of God. My God, to hit the church one more time. That would cause people to hit their knees and pray. I would desire to have such a prayer life that my knees would be so calloused, so bruised, so calloused that if nothing else spoke about it, my bruised knees spoke about it. 
my knees that were scarred and, and, and calloused and, and listen there's no beauty whatsoever my God all it re reflected was the glory of God sometimes the glory of God is not what we call beauty it's a beauty on a different level amen, amen. it's a crucified walk it's a glory walk my God but Enoch and again I believe that we're in the Enoch generation but that walk with God that causes the church world one more time to hunger after nothing but the things of God. I've got a news flash for you. As you get older, you do come to a time that you say, Lord, all I want to close this side of me, turn it out with God is to see the glory of God, the majesty of God, not the things of the world, not, not the glory of the world, not the flesh and lights of the world, but God what length of time I've got left. God, let me see a move of God that will cause the need of the most sinful person to bow and acknowledge there is a God that will cause the most hardened heart to confess that there is a God, that faith would arise to some extent, that all we talk about is what God is doing. The other day I went to the house and I turned Fox News off I thought, God, I don't need to hear that. I don't need to hear another voice. The voice I need to hear is the voice of the living God. Enoch walked with God, and he could hear from God. He knew what God wanted for him. Do you know what God wants for you? Do you really know what God, the kind of walk God wants you to have? Enoch knew the walk that pleased God. He knew the walk. That would satisfy God. He knew how to get in lockstep with God. To walk with God, you've got to get in lockstep with Him. For before His translation, He had a testimony that He pleased God. That He pleased God. That He pleased God. That He pleased God. I said that He pleases God. Messiah. That he pleased God. To please God doesn't mean that you please yourself every time. Or that you please someone else every time. But if we please God, it's got some rapture power to it. Now it's one thing for me to get up here and, and, and shout and I love it. But that doesn't mean that I've got resurrection power. Just because the Lord spoke and said, I'm decoding, doesn't mean that I've got rapture-ready power. So my good feeling every now and then doesn't mean that I've got resurrection power or translation power. But what does symbolize translation power? It's when my walk with God links up, my God synchronizes with the walk of God. How did Enoch know what God required of him? Well, I believe he could hear from God. I believe he knew. But then in verse 7, I believe that we're in the generation of Noah. It said, by faith, Noah. Now, it took faith for Enoch to have the testimony that he had. He didn't have that within himself. It took faith to believe that he had a testimony that would please God. What is my testimony? What is your testimony? A testimony is a visible experience, something that you've got to experience to present before God. So what is my testimony? My testimony is this. Like Job, though he slay me, I'm going to serve him. Things may not go like I like, but I'm going to serve God. Things may not happen like I want them to, but I'm going to serve God. What is our testimony, church? Are we going to be the light of the city? A church that is set on a hill that cannot be hid? Or are we going to be just a mediocre church? The kind of just get by church. All we're going to do, like the writer said, earnestly contend for that faith 
There's a faith out there somehow, somewhere, Marika. There is a faith somehow within our reach. If we'll reach high enough, my God, if we will reach high enough and bow low enough on our knees, there is a faith out there that's going to please God. Sometimes my faith don't please God. Sometimes my faith wavers. Sometimes my faith is not stable under pressure. Sometimes my faith doesn't reach out very far. But somewhere out there, and the Word said the older saints had it. The older saints. Back in the day, can you remember back in the day when some of the older saints, they'd be over 100 years old now. But they had a faith that could please God under any circumstance. They had that faith. Back during the Depression, no jobs, no work, no nothing. Honey, somebody had faith to believe that if they would just pray that God would put some meal in the meal barrel, that God would put some oil in the oil cruise, that God would put shoes on the kids' feet, clothes on their back. Remember how Raymond used to tell about his dad, such a man of faith. The snow fell that winter. They didn't have any food in the house. No food to sit on the table. But his dad told him, says, boys, let's pray. We got to pray. He wasn't going to send them to school without a warm meal, but there was no food in the house. They got down to pray, and they heard the doorbell ring. Raymond's dad said, Maurice, go to the door. See who's there. They went to the door, and there was what, how many baskets of food sitting on the, the steps? But no, and there was a snow. There was a deep snow on the ground. They didn't see any footsteps. But I think two big baskets of food someone had brought and put down on the porch. But there was no footsteps of anyone that came. But there was a faith that prevailed over the circumstance. I've been praying. I said, God. I want a prayer life that my prayer will prevail over a situation. Let my prayer prevail, let my faith prevail over my obstacle. How do you have prevailing faith and prevailing prayer? Enoch knew, for by faith he did this. Let's move now to the generation of Noah. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen. I would say the last five years, at least in this place of worship, God has spoken things that warned us, but it brought no fear. It's one thing to be warned of God and have fear, but it's another thing to be warned of God and ignore it and have no fear. We've seen God speak here and then turn right around and sit, come to pass. Before this thing with Biden and his outfit landed, went into action, the Lord spoke here. He said there's a network that has been formed against America. We heard that, but we didn't understand it. But we didn't allow it to motivate us to hit the altar and say, now God, you spoke and we don't understand. Lord, what is that network? Show us what the network is that's laid out against our country and against the church world. Lord, reveal. you see, God wants to reveal to us things that's about to happen. He spoke while ago and said, I'm decoding. That means to reveal secrets. Hasha. So what I'm hearing, my Bakia, is he is he's he's going to reveal secrets, and these secrets will amaze 
the most learned people, Pataya. These secrets are going to uproot the strong, Amakaya. These secrets are going to confound the wise. Because these secrets have been kept from the foundation of the earth. This is not man's secrets that God's going to uh, decode. He's going to decode his own secrets, his own mind, his own will. My God, his own way of doing things. He's going to decode it to the church world. He's going to breathe the breath of fresh air, my God, into the very nostrils of humanity. The church has got to have a uh, fresh air. My God, the fresh air from the breath of God. The church world has got to have a move of God like we have never experienced ever, ever, ever in our life. Noah heard from God and God said, No, honey, it's going to rain. There's going to be a rain like you have never seen. There's going to be something happen that you have never heard of, Noah. But he gave Noah the, the blueprint. He gave Noah the pattern. God has given the church a pattern. Hashalika. There's going to be a leak of information I said a leak of information from the highest ranks of our government there's going to be a, a leak of a high yacht it's still a car, and it's going to be a deadly thing it's going to be kind of like, the, like the, 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 the power of praying people has stopped a rattlesnake of a high shot I said it's, like, it's going to be like the, the prayer of praying people has stopped a rattlesnake that's already poised to strike. Thank you, God. We've got to keep praying. We've got to get a hold of that, that realm of faith that Jude spoke about. He said the kind of faith you have sometimes, you, you pray for you pray for natural things. You have faith for natural things. But what was Enoch having faith for? He was having faith for the rapture. Church, we've got to start having some faith for the rapture, the getting out of here. Lord, move us out of this place, my God, from natural to supernatural, from natural, my God, to the spirit realm. What was Noah having faith for? His household. Noah was contending for faith for his household. God gave him a plan for his household. He said, no, if you'll do it like this, if you'll do it like I tell you to do, you'll see your household saved. You know what the Lord's telling the church? If I can get you to pray, Pahasha, if I can get you to be committed to all time, get a hold of faith, a uh, uh, faith kind, listen, get your face in the four kind, Bury your face up, my God, in the sand if you have to, but get a hold of some faith that works when the showdown comes. Get a hold of some faith, my God, that works when the showdown comes. That kind of faith. That's what Noah was contending for. Well, we're in a, a, a generation, we've got to contend for the faith to believe that our kids ain't going to split hell wide open. There's a hell out there. I said there's a hell out there, and it's, it's got flames of fire in it. My nephew told about a man that he kept talking to about his soul. That man would make fun of him and say, you know what? In other words, I'm going to knock the devil's head off or something to that effect. He couldn't do nothing, couldn't get to him about his soul. But one day the man got sick. And they called for the nephew to come and pray. Got there, started praying, and the man was still making fun of God. Still would not accept the fact that he was lost and undone, didn't care. Wasn't afraid of the devil. Wasn't afraid of nothing. But as he realized he was dying, there was a change. His kids were there. True story. His kids were there. He got to screaming. He said, pull me out of this fire. Pull me out of this fire. I can feel the flames of hell. I can feel the flames. Pull me out of this fire. His kids were trying to pick him up, move him, but it didn't work. It was too late. Church, we've got a mandate. Now, they're talking about a mandate about the vaccine. The church world's got a mandate. We better start early pulling souls out of fire before the thing is too late. How do we do that? Prayer. Prayer 
and faith and more faith. There's a realm of faith that we've got to get a hold of in this end time that will make a difference. But each one, have, they were striving for a different thing, but it took faith on each part. Noah's faith. He was upset about his, his household. He wanted to see his household saved. But then, uh, now these were natural things. Enoch, he wanted to get out of here. He wanted, he wanted to be translated. Noah, he wanted to see his household saved. But then we get down to Abraham. When he was called by faith to go out into a place which he should, he should later receive as the inheritance, you know what he did? He went not knowing whether he went by faith. And this blessed me. Others had faith to believe for their children, their grandchildren, for strength. But Abraham, he said, Lord, my faith that I'm going to strive for is the faith for something not, not made by hand. He said, I'm looking for a city. Ha. Huh. Whose builder and maker is God. Most of the time, our faith is for faith for me as a pastor. For faith to believe that everybody will show up at church. Our faith to believe that when I pray for you, God's going to heal you. Pray for you that you'll get the Holy Ghost. That fresh, all fresh fire, something fresh, will get a hold of you and encourage you to keep in this walk with God. As a mama, I pray for the salvation of my household. I pray that God will provide them with necessities. But you know, there comes a time that you've got to be like Abraham. Lord, what I'm pressing for is something I've never seen before. Something I've never had before. Abraham said, I see it afar off. And I'm willing to leave everything for it. But I'm going to press. I'm going to reach hold for that city. That city that's not made by hand. Child of God, there is a place not made by hand that we've got to press for. That we're going to contend for by the grace of God. We do a lot of our pressing for things that won't amount to a hill of beans after a while. Most of what you spend your anxiety over is stuff that after a while it ain't going to amount to nothing. But yet we toil and worry and, and do a run and have nervous breakdowns and everything else over something that ain't going to last. But if we can get a hold of a vision of God, if we can get a hold of that crown, Paul said, I, my God, he said, I see that.